Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the last Bible study we did, I wanted, was hoping that you could see a little bit of the ocean in the background, uh, the little small view that I have from the deck, and it really didn't come through in that uh, Bible study that we did recently on the deck. So I wanted to share with you the sunset and the ocean. Very rarely do we have clear crystal days that we can see all the way down there. And I just wanted to share that with you and some scripture to encourage the brethren. So hopefully that intro encouraged you, Brother Sister Christ, and exhorted you to get back into the Word of God. Um, I got Victoria up here. Why do we have Victoria up here? So that's the first part of this. I know I said I wasn't going to do a Bible study video. Not a Bible study video. A prayer request video. Okay, for this month, because we did it in the uh, update to the ministry, had some things going on around here that was kind of slowing me down uh, and not being able to put out as many Bible study videos. However, when I got to the point where I started putting out some Bible studies, we had another situation happen here with Victoria. And I want to share that with you, a testimony of God's grace and God's mercy. And Victoria, about a week ago, she had either a heart attack or she had a micro seizure. Um, something happened where she lost use of the, her back legs and she kept falling over. Like she kept leaning to one side and falling over. Like she, she couldn't set up straight. She couldn't walk straight. She kept leaning over and falling over. And her eyes, when I lay her down on my lap and hold her, I was looking at her, she was trying to look at me, and as she would look up, her eyes started rolling to the back of her head and everything, and I got scared. I mean, she's old. Not scared, scared, because we're not given a spirit of fear. Not, I mean, I just scared in the sense that maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. She's 14 years old. All right. They're supposed to live around 17 years. Uh, if, I used to say if you're lucky when I was lost. I was about to say it again. Forgive me, Lord. Um, if God wills. It's God's will. It's not luck. It's God's will. Okay? And blessings. If it was God's blessing on this home and on me that allowed her to live to the full 17 years. But she's very old. However, in the last week, praise the Lord, she's back to walking again. She can walk just fine. She just got her hair cut today. And now she's got all this energy. She's grabbing her toy. She's back to walking. Every once in a while, she'll still fall over and then get back up. I mean, that's still there. But she's back to a lot of energy. She's, she's, she's made a, a great recovery. And it's a testimony of my prayers. I know the brethren have been praying lately, not for this specific situation. I had a chance to share it with you, Brother Jesus Christ. But you've been praying for me because of Victoria's health and everything and for Victoria. And I just wanted to thank the brethren for your prayers. I know she's just a pet. I know she is. I, 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 but I thank you. I still thank you so much for the prayer request. So, what? 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 <laughs> like I said, she's got her energy back. 
and she's doing good. She's walking. She still tends to go the left side of, of the of the room and walk along the wall, which makes me think that she's losing eyes. She's lost her eyesight in her right eye. So she's kind of either gone blind in one eye, or maybe she had. I just like I said, just got the haircut done. The hair in her eyes. Maybe she had hair covering too much this side. She can only see with this side. But she seems to be doing good. She's playing. She's got her toy. She was trying to tear her toy to pieces. And she was getting out there. And she was having fun. I took her for a walk. She started to walk. Lately I've been only been able to do a walk for the last month and a half. Walk her up the driveway. And there's a little part of the road goes just barely above the house. Cause like, I don't know if you know, for Brothers and Sisters Christ that might be new to the ministry of this channel. Uh, I have five acres here, but most of the acreage is on hillside. I mean hillside that I can't use. I mean, I probably could if I was younger and I built all these um, terraces, you know, like steps, like walls that I could grow stuff in, um, retaining walls and stuff like that. But for the most part, I have a little bit of land, probably half an acre to an acre's worth of land that I'm actually using, including what the house is on. And the hillside goes up behind me and the hillside goes down below me. And I walk up above the house and we can stand there above the house and look at the ocean and see the sun go down and everything and and I shared it with you before and she's been able to walk up there and walk back down with me and she's been doing like going slow but after she's had that I don't know what it was like I said a micro seizure or it might be a heart at attack a, mi a minor heart attack or something at her age or something but now in the last week, I mean, there for, it was touch and go there for a few days because, like I said, she couldn't use her back legs. And then when she could start using her back legs, you'd stand her up and she'd sit there and she'd be like, I'm, I'm going to fall over. And then when she started walking, she started walking and leaning like this and then she'd fall over. And like I said, when I held her in my lap, her eyes sometimes looked like they were rolling to the back of her head. And I was like, well, this might be it. This might be the time to say goodbye. You know, and I just, I really want to thank a testimony. Thank the brethren for their prayers. Now, brothers, says Christ, real quick. I want to give a great Bible example. This is what you call a blessing, okay? Victoria's a blessing, but I'm talking about what happened is a blessing. She's recovered. She's doing good. I don't know for how long. This might be just temporary. It's a blessing forever how long I get to keep her for as long as I can. It's a blessing. Now, if it was a miracle when she had her, whatever caused her to do that, I put my hand on her and go, in Jesus' name, be healed. And I let go, and she she goes, poof, jumps up, back to being perfectly normal instantly. That's called the working of miracles. That's a miracle. This wasn't a miracle. Brother. I know we kind of, sometimes we get, some of us are desperate for wanting to see a miracle. Um, but there are miracles out there. Okay, and like I said before, the greatest miracle that I see today, Brother and Sister Christ, especially in these last days, the greatest miracle I see, Brother Sister Christ, is someone that gets saved today. And these last days, okay, uh, we'll be talking about that. Can you tell the difference between the two other than their color? But New King James, King James. Okay. The Bible perversions, the false religions out there, how they perverted Christianity, true Christianity according to the scriptures, okay? In Christ, someone who follows Christ. Well, now there's so many anti-Christs out there, and they're claiming to follow Christ. They like to call themselves Christians, and they're not Christians. And people, when, you know, I've always said this before, it's easier to deal with someone who doesn't have, uh, doesn't know who Jesus is, period. Lately, I hardly deal with anybody who's never heard of a Jesus. They, when we witness today, brother, sister, Christ, it's like you're dealing with people that have already been corrupted. I'm not talking about sin, because that's what we're trying to let them know about sin and death and hell and the lake of fire. We're letting them know the wages of sin is death. How do you get out of that? Uh, repentance, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, ask God to save you. But when we're trying to preach the real Jesus Christ to them, they've already been tainted up here in their mind by a false Jesus, an antichrist, 
and it's so hard to reach people today. So when you see someone get saved today in this in these la in the last days, I know every generation says that because that's how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope as if it could happen in our time. And we see the world getting worse and worse over generation after generation. Each generation says the next generation is worse, and it is. And today, I believe we're in the last days, brother, says Christ. I really do. And to see someone get saved today, brother, says Christ, that to me is the greatest miracle. What Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, and how he died for our sins according to the scripture and how he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's the greatest miracle ever. The greatest wonder of God. So I wanted to show Victoria and let you guys know how she was doing. There for a while I was about to say she was doing great, but then she had a very scary turn. And now she's back to doing great. She's back to doing great. <laughs> so... I'm going to go ahead and take her down, and we're going to switch to another topic. Uh, we're going to stay on prayer, topic of prayer, but we're going to give some testimonies real quick. So let me get her off the table, more of the desk. Yeah. Okay, brothers and sisters of Christ, what I want to talk about next, I know I've showed this picture again, this that the Lord blessed me with. I found this at a secondhand store, and I, I like this picture, I really do. It, it shows humbleness. Um, a little mess of pottage. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. I'll try to take... Well, I've already shown it before in the past, but if you can't see it right now, there's an old man. He's bowing his head. He's praying. There's a little piece of bread on the table. There's a mess of pottage on the table. There's a Bible on the table. There's glasses on the Bible. He's an old man. It's hard to see. He starts getting glasses. And he's got a little knife there to cut the bread because you'd cut the bread and you'd dip it in the pottage. And that's his meal for the day. Not three square meals a day, you know, just gluttony. That's your meal for the day, and you prayed. You prayed over your meal. So, the thing I wanted to bring up real quick to encourage the brethren, I talk about it all the time. We read it all the time when we do our prayers. Uh, pray without ceasing. Let your requests be made known unto God. But we talk about praying without ceasing. And I tell you, brothers Christ, this is a good thing. Please understand. It is a good thing to talk to God. You're walking. You're talking with the Lord. When you're working, you're talking with the Lord when you take breaks. You're supposed to pray without ceasing. When I'm working in the garden, I talk with the Lord. When I'm working with the chicken coop, I talk with the Lord. When I'm walking Victoria, Victoria! When I'm walking Victoria, I, I talk with the Lord. When I sit out on the deck and listen to God's Word, or I'm reading God's Word, I pause places and talk to God about His Word. But what I really want to talk about here is that is a good, all good and well, and we should be doing that. But there's sometimes God put it on my heart to share with you that there's sometimes I realize in my life that, like, when's the last time I had a fervent prayer? I talk to God all the time. Am I getting too complacent with God, too friendly in the point I'm not treating Him as God? But the thing is about fervent prayer, fervently praying, okay? James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Brothers and sisters of Christ, that's my prayer for you. I pray for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that you stay in prayer and that you stay in the Word of God every day. And you're hiding God's Word in your heart and you're living it and you're looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living by studying the Word, by reading the Word, by hiding it in your heart, by living it, by praying to God, by singing hymns, singing psalms and hymns. I apologize for the dark barking. Like I said, she just she's got all this energy now, you know. So, Victoria. She's got all this energy now. Victoria. Confess your faults one to another, pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent. What's the difference between a regular prayer and fervent prayer? 
Well, here's a good example. I can sit there on the deck and be rocking, and I can be talking with the Lord, looking at the sunset, as I just showed before this video, looking at the sunset, and just talking with the Lord. I can be sitting there with my hands, and I can be working in the garden, and I can be talking with the Lord. I can be seated. But what, what's the difference between that prayer and fervent prayer? Fervent prayer is where you bow your head, you close your eyes, you might even get on your knees. And what you're doing is you're, you're pushing everything in this world out so you can focus 100% on the Lord. And you come to Him with a need. Sometimes you're coming to Him in this situation with great thanks. Lord, I'm so blessed to have this Bible, have these glasses to read the Bible, to have this food, this one meal a day, the clothes that He's wearing. That at His age, I'm still being able to, you're being able to serve the Lord. For his health, sometimes you can do fervent prayer where it's all about just giving God glory and giving God thanks. Sometimes you, sometimes people only get to fervent prayer just because they need something. When you need something, you start doing fervent prayer. Okay? But sometimes you can do a fervent prayer where it's just all about praising God and thanking Him for everything. Number one thing I told you lately that I've been doing is I've been sometimes falling back to the gospel and I've been thanking God for saving me. Just flat out saving me. Okay. Fervent, what does it mean? You, you really focus 100% on prayer. You don't do anything else. The only thing you're doing is praying. Okay. I understand there's multitasking. Like I said, we're to pray without ceasing. You can pray to God while you're doing things. But fervent prayers, when you put everything to the side and you take time out to just get on your knees uh, to before your bed, lean against your bed, uh, you're sitting there before your meal and you're bowing your head and you're closing your eyes. People think that's the only way you can pray. No, it isn't. You can pray to God. Okay? With your eyes open, you can pray to God and talk with the Lord. Remember, He is God. Don't get too friendly to the point that we forget. Yes, He's our Savior. Okay? He's our master. He's our capital of Lord. He's our king. So a lot of people like to treat him as friend. He's just my friend. He's just my friend. Well, we'll do a study on that again because I've been getting into a, a brother. Uh, hopefully she's a sister in Christ online. They're misusing the word friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I, whatsoever I command you. And the whole context of that, and we'll get into it with scripture, not just my words, is that it's talking about friend, the opposite of an enemy. But people are treating Jesus like he's their best friend. They just slap him on the, uh, on the chest. Hey, what's up? What's up, Jesus? He's my best friend. He's my homeboy. All right? We need to remember who Jesus is and not forget it. And we need to come to him and humble ourselves. Fervent prayer. Okay? And it says, Of the righteous man that availeth much. I have my notes over here. Um... Righteous, righteous man, there's two parts to it real quick to understand. The first part, which we need to know, is, is God will not hear the prayers of somebody that's lost unless it's to come to salvation. I'll explain how that works when you're lost. But you have to be saved predominantly for God to hear your prayers. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness. And it goes on, sanctification, redemption. But for what we're talking about here, made us righteousness. God's righteousness is imputed to us. So when you have a man that humbles himself, and God's righteousness is imputed to him, and he's doing fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Okay? The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayers that you really get the most out of, and I talk to God a lot, but the prayers you get the most out of, Brother Sister Christ, is when you take time to stop everything that you're doing and to set and actually talk with the Lord one-on-one -on -one doing nothing else, no distractions, and fervently pray to the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. I do fervent prayer out on the deck where I'm sitting there, and I'll close my eyes and I'll just pray. I do fervent prayer before I go to sleep at night. Fervent prayer when I get up in the morning. I haven't always done that. Like I said, God's really been convicting me that I need to get back to doing some more fervent prayer than I have done. I talk to God all the time. Brothers and Christ, we talk to God all the time. But we need to get back to fervent prayer. Now, like I said, 
That's the righteous man, someone who's got Jesus' righteousness imputed to him. But God will hear the prayer of someone who's lost under one condition. Okay, Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Regard, hold. When you have sin on your heart, you're in the, you're in the process of sinning, and you're holding it in your heart, and you won't let go of that sin with your heart. Now, I'm not saying clean up your life. I'm saying with your heart. I love my sin. I'm going to keep my sin. You know there's times where God won't listen to a prayer of a saved man? If you start getting into wicked sin and you're holding on to that sin and you won't let go of that sin and you start holding that sin in your heart, God will start chasing you to get you to let go, like smack you upside the head to get you to let go of that sin. Absolutely. But what hinders your prayer life? Sin. Holding iniquity in your heart. You can sin and fail the Lord and repent, forsake, and jump right back up and get back to praying, get back to your walk with the Lord, and it's a speed bump. But there are times men that are saved will fall into a ditch hardcore, like headlong in a car in a, a sinkhole, and be stuck there for a while. Why? Because they're holding that sin in their heart and they refuse to repent and forsake. Now the lost man holds that sin in their heart because their attitude towards sin is, I love my sin, I don't have a problem with my sin or sinning against God. So how does God hear the prayer of someone who's lost that doesn't have Jesus' righteousness imputed to him? Well, when you truly get, get saved, before God saves you, you come to the cross broken. And you throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross. Your heartfelt attitude towards sin changes, and you no longer love sin. You hate sin. You hate wickedness. You hate your wicked state and how you've been towards God, your Creator. How you've treated God, your Creator. And you take those iniquities and you throw them at the foot of the cross. So when you pray the prayer, like you're confessing your repentance and your belief in prayer and asking God to save you, that's how God hears the prayer of a lost person coming to salvation. And when God saves you, boom, then God's righteousness is imputed to you. Right? But getting back to the, the fervent prayer, Brother Jesus Christ, when's the last time you've had some fervent prayer? When's the last time you sat down for, well, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, taking an hour out from doing anything, and just sat there praying? Remember what Jesus said, we do it in the closet. Okay. Uh, when we pray, we pray in the closet so we're not seen of men. I've always pushed this, brothers to Christ, and I've had some brethren disagree with me, but I've always pushed this. The reason you don't see me praying before every study and after every study is because prayer is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you, a personal relationship between you and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is God, the Father manifest in the flesh. It's your personal relationship with God. It's, most, it's meant to be predominantly one-on-one. -on -one. Now, you can pray, your, 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 if you got children, wives, husbands, they can see you pray. I mean, they're going to come across you praying. If you're praying without ceasing, and they come across and, and catch you, you know, bowing your head before food, you look at Jesus, the time that the, the, the people heard Jesus pray for the most part, part was over food, before he broke the bread and the fish that fed the 5,000. If he prayed all the time in front of everyone, why would they come to him and ask him, Lord, how do we pray? Teach us how to pray. They would see how he prays and go, oh, that's how you do it. He prayed in secret, one-on-one, -on -one, set an example for us. Your prayer life is going to be predominantly one-on-one. -on -one. Be careful of those people in the Babel buildings and everything. That It's always got to be putting on a show, putting on a show when they do prayer. Prayer is predominantly one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't mean two of you can't come together and pray together. Absolutely not. But I'm telling you, 90% of your prayer life plus should predominantly be one-on-one -on -one between you and the Lord. And I, like I said, my encouragement to you, brother and sister Christ, after you watch this video, is to take some time with the Lord. Take some time with the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. I understand you, you're, some of you can be very busy. We're all busy at some times, and sometimes we don't, we're not busy. But take some time where you're not doing anything except praying. And take some time to do some fervent prayer, even if, it is, even if it's just to give God glory for everything He's done for you. Give God thanks for everything He's done for you. But like I mentioned before, we in, this in this passage it says pray for one another. 
confess your walls, faults to one another. Another thing to do in fervent prayer, hardcore, and I do it, brother says Christ, is confessing your faults to the Lord one on one. God knows your faults, but confessing your faults to the Lord and asking God's help with your specific faults. The sins that trip you up. You know, some people say they struggle with pride. Some people say they struggle with bitterness. Some people say they struggle with being patient, waiting on the Lord. Right. Being patient. Some people struggle with being content. Some people struggle with temptations of whatever. We have faults. But we're also supposed to be praying for one another. We desperately, in these last days, brothers and sisters in Christ, we desperately need to be doing some fervent prayer for the brothers and sisters in Christ in these last days. Overseas, here in America, everywhere. We also need to be doing some fervent, fervent prayer for men in ministry, that those that are still standing remain standing. And those that are starting to fall away to the lowercase g gods of this world, where they, they can turn something into a lowercase g god. When you start loving something more than you love Jesus Christ, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not talking about I can't love. i got some tea in here. It doesn't say I can't love tea. But if it came between this tea and my Lord and Savior, the tea goes bye-bye. Why? Because my Lord comes first. I love God more than I love the things of this world. And if I start saying, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put God to the side, and this comes first, this starts becoming a lowercase g God. Okay? Idolatry. Now, don't get me wrong, T is not, not a sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just talking about when you start loving. I'm just using this as an example. You can use a lot of, I can probably use a lot better things. It's just what's at hand. But if you start loving uh, that home, trying to live your dream life, that home, that car. There's some people that are starting to fall. Um, drugs, alcohol, pride. You start loving your pride and, 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 and being puffed up. You start getting into loving your bitterness. And so on and so forth. Sin. You start, there are certain sins in your life you start to love and you're going to hold on to them. That's sin. But you can have innocent things in your life like your wife or your husband. Are you putting God first? Or is your husband uh, pleasing your husband? Remember what the Bible says about pleasing your husband and pleasing your wife? Over pleasing God? Pleasing family members over pleasing God? Pleasing your children over pleasing God? Pleasing your friends? Because you don't want to look bad in front of your friends. Pleasing your friends over God? They can become a lowercase g God. It can become idolatry when they come first before God. Okay? We need to be praying for men in ministry that they stay the course. That they don't get distracted by this world. Remember the three enemies of this world. They're flesh, the world, and Satan. They, we desperately need to be praying for anybody that's trying to preach, trying to teach the word of God, trying to, like I am, trying to encourage you. I desperately need prayer from the brethren in these last days. Okay, we need to be praying for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be praying for men in ministry. Okay, please, fervent prayer. Take some time to do some fervent prayer. Right. Okay, brothers and sisters in Christ, I have a, a couple testimonies I want to get based off of the ministry of reconciliation. But remember, prayer requests for the brethren. My number one prayer for, for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and please pray for me in the same thing and pray for all the brethren, is that we stay in prayer. Okay, um, right here that we get some fervent prayer going okay please please help us uh, I pray the Lord all the time help me stay in prayer help me stay in your word it's the second prayer request by Jesus Christ that we stay in the Word of God okay? we hide it in our heart and we live it and we be a living witness as well as a verbal witness okay? that we keep our eyes the third prayer that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ that blessed hope the Bible talks about and Peter, always be ready to answer and give someone the hope that is in you. Okay, that blessed hope. Now, I've got two testimonies of trying to witness, and both didn't turn out good. And the whole point of this is encouragement, brothers and Christ, that no matter what happens, no matter what happens, that you keep fighting the good fight when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation. And that we're praying for the brethren when it comes to the ministry of reconciliation. Why are we still here? 
We got saved. Why didn't God call us up immediately? Because He wants us to be a living witness, a light unto the world. He's the light of the world, and He's supposed to shine through us. Okay? So before we get into these two, I was witnessing. Like, there was a woman holding a sign saying, looking for work, homeless. Okay? So I was watching a Bible study done by uh, a brother in Christ where he's talking about, how, are you getting out to the, to the area you live? Are you trying to reach people for Christ? The witnessing, the ministry of reconciliation, are you being a light to the world? Okay? And it kind of convicted my heart a little bit. So I went into town to, uh, to um, a, three, a few days ago, I was into town doing something else. Sometimes I like to grab notes. Like, well, this is, this is the hymn, Jesus' name above all names. But sometimes I like to grab uh, my notes that I make for, for Bible studies. And I'll jump in the truck and I will drive to the, uh, there's a place where you can park right next to the beach. As long as I can stand from all appearance of evil, I'll park next to the beach. Or I'll go along the highway. There's a highway here. There's a place you can park. There's also, one well, of these days I might do a video, just like I did the intro here, just trying to show some of the beauty around here. But there's also the back road here that goes up. I went up there and did a picnic and sat there and talked with the Lord and listened to 1 Corinthians. The whole book of 1 Corinthians I sat out there. And you can see the valley and you can see mountains. It's very beautiful. I like to go out in nature with the Word of God. So I went and did that, and as I was coming home, I passed her on the road, a woman holding a sign saying, homeless will work, I can't remember if it said, will work for food or looking for work, okay? And I, I just was convicted, so I decided I'd pull off and I would try to witness to her as I was trying to help her. Now around here, Brother Sister Christ... I have my gospel tracks, and what I try to do is I try to fold these up, and I do like five of them, and I'll go around laying out gospel tracks, try to do this every time I go out, and I pray this for you, Brother Jesus Christ, that you're getting a hold of some gospel tracks, but what the Lord, the Lord in this past year or so has been putting on my heart is to try to be a verbal witness, to have courage to actually verbally witness, not just lay these out. Uh, to hand them to people personally, face to face. Here's the gospel track. Can I tell you about my Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I don't have much time. Well, then can I give you this gospel track? Can you read it when you do have time? Okay. That kind of thing. Okay. So my plan was to give her a gospel track, give her a little bit of money, and um, I started asking her about her situation and everything. And the whole point is, is I'm trying to witness to her for Jesus Christ she was the first one to bring it up, religion. And I started quoting, this is a King James Bible, I started quoting from the King James Bible. Okay, this is a small one, but I started uh, quoting from the King James Bible. The moment I started quoting scripture, she got, she, her demeanor changed. She started out being all nice and quiet and very peaceful and really, you know, fast talking, but, but you know, like she was, you know, calm and and friendly, friendly, that's the key word, friendly. I started quoting scripture to her and she started getting upset. Okay, First she claimed to be saved, so I was like, okay, okay, let's talk about God. Let's talk about God through his word. That's what I always do. I treat them like they're saved and I start talking to them about God through his word. And she started getting upset. See, her Jesus, her Jesus wouldn't hurt anybody. Her Jesus loves everybody. Her Jesus wouldn't uh, punish her in any way, shape, or form. And I got into the Word and I said, well, well, doesn't God's Word say this here? And doesn't God's Word say, you know, but, but God's Word said that He will chasten you as a father would a child? In the book of Hebrews? Doesn't the Bible say the wages of sin is death? I don't know what said. Um, I said, the, the, uh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die? There's still way, you know. There's still a consequence to sin down here. Uh, you don't, you're, you're telling me you don't think God would would uh, chastise you to get you back on the right path? And she just started flipping out and everything. And when she started flipping out, I was like, okay, something's not right. So I went from that type type of attitude, and I started preaching the gospel to her. I said, well, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you know, you go into the gospel. You know, true biblical repentance, godly sorrow, 
Uh, for God, for God, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. That's why the wages of sin is death. The sorrows of the world is going to lead you to hell. And I start just laying it on thick, and I start talking about Jesus Christ, my Savior. And that made her even more mad. To the point where she started yelling, and this is what she said that really got to me, brother, since Christ. She started yelling, you're offending my spirit. Well, we know it's not the Holy Spirit. Because if it was the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have been offended. I'm preaching His perfect written word. God's perfect written word. So it kind of makes you wonder what kind of spirit she had in her. And what bothers me, brother, sister Christ, and I've mentioned this before, everybody that I come across when it comes to Jesus Christ and the true plan of salvation, they've been tainted. They've been utterly and completely tainted. They're, what they know is perverted. It's not the truth. It's not the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. I don't like using this book because it looks weird in the color. It's a King James, but King James. It's not the Jesus of the King James Bible. They don't know the Jesus of the King James Bible. They don't know the true plan of salvation. And the reason I'm giving this testimony is, is normally when I was newly saved, I, I, it's fearful. And please understand what I'm saying, Brother Sister Christ, and some of you do. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Okay, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but sometimes it's very, you can co go through some very scary situations when trying to preach the gospel, and that might put you off to saying, to, to making you like get more reserved, and we need to be out there preaching the gospel, brothers and sisters Christ. It's not that you're, and I want you to know, it's not, you're not, not that you're ashamed, it's that you can go through a scary moment. And that was pretty scary, the way she was t going crazy on me. And as I was walking back to my truck, there was another lady standing there that she had pulled up a couple minutes after I did and saw me walk over and she was going to wait to see, you know, if I was going to help her and then she was going to see if she could help her. And when I walked to her, I explained to her, why is she yelling at you? And I quoted scripture to her. And she's yelling at her and I said, it got, I told her, I said, I was trying to witness for Jesus Christ, my Savior, and she just flipped out. And I was going to try to help her. I was going to give her some money. I was going to give her a gospel track. And I was going to try to verbal witness to her. And she just flipped out on me. And that lady was going to do the same thing. Okay. Now, I, I, I was talking with her. I'm not saying she's lost. But I'm not going to guarantee that that woman that I was talking to that parked next to me uh, is saved. But she's sitting there, and we start talking about the Bible, and we start jumping all over the Bible here and there. She believes that we should keep the Sabbath day. We should. Not that you have to, but we should. And it kind of made me wonder where she was coming from. So I got to talk to her for a little bit with the Bible. And like we talked for about 20 or 30 minutes. And I explained to her I'm a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. I got my magnets, Bible magnets. I, sh I talked to her about the gospel that I, per that, I, that I believe is the true gospel that I got saved off of. And as we're talking, the, the local police car pulled by. Like I said, all I did was stop by, try to give her a gospel track, was going to give her some money, and try to witness to her on my way home. On my way home. I felt that conviction. I should try something on my way home. And if this could discourage some babes in Christ if this happened to you as a babe in Christ. I'm not a babe in Christ, praise the Lord. Anyway. But if I was, this would be very disconcerting what's going on. But the cop pulled by. And he got out and said, we got a report that you were harassing somebody, like a homeless person. And I just explained to him, I was nice, I was very kind about it. I said, I said officer, I, I try, she has a sign saying she needed help. I was trying to witness to her for my Savior. And I was going to give her some money. And I was going to try to help her out. And I was just witnessing to her. And when I realized she got out of control and upset... I just walked away. I said, I can't help her. I walked away. And brothers and sisters Christ, God works things amazingly. That woman that pulled up beside me, she pulled up and saw the whole thing. She goes, I'm a witness. I saw the whole thing. He, he tried to help her. She didn't want the help. He walked away. I walked away. But this woman, like I said, this woman was almost like she was devil possessed. I really do. Because like I said, you're offending my spirit with the scriptures you know who's offended by the word of God Satan 
Remember what John talks about in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd uh, John? Where he talks about, I think it's 1st John, where he gets right into it and talks about the Antichrist spirit that's even now in the world today. Evil spirits, Antichrist spirit, they don't like the Word of God. They don't. Right? Anytime they saw Jesus, the manifest Word, they'd fall on the ground. Start rending themselves, going crazy, they'd fall on the ground and, and worship Him and I'm doing a study right now, fall on the ground and worship him. Okay? They react differently to the capital W word and they react differently to the lowercase w word. Okay? I just the, the cops was really nice. It's just a few minutes. Talked to the cop for a little bit and explain like I said, I explained what happened. Nothing major happened out of it. He just said, okay, well, that's what I thought it was, and and well, you guys have a good day. And he was on his way. I got in the car, and the reason I'm giving this testimony by Christ, I got in the car after talking to one lady, and uh, the lady that pulled up beside me, not the lady that was crazy, but anybody who rejects Jesus Christ and his perfect written word, I think is crazy. But I was crazy at one time. We've all been crazy at one time. But I got in the car, and I started feeling like a failure. I was like, could I have said something differently? I remember the, the verse I was saying as I was walking away, I said, Jesus said, if a man love me, he will, because she was yelling at me, and I was like, if a man loved me, I was walking away, I said, if a man loved me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. Because she started mocking and putting down the word of God. And I said, but you claim to be a Christian, you claim to love Jesus Christ. And I said that as I was walking away. And I was like, Evidently, you know, and these are the people we have to deal with, and this is why it's so hard today, and that's why I say this, brothers of Christ, I think the greatest miracle we're going to see today, we're not going to see the miracles that, that, that a lot of people want to see. We're not going to see miracles like what Moses did. We're not going to see miracles like what uh, Elijah did. We're not going to see miracles like what Jesus did, as far as in his earthly ministry before his death, burial, and resurrection. We're not going to see miracles like what Peter and Paul were doing, okay, before the, the sign gifts went away. The greatest miracle we're going to see today, brothers and sisters in Christ, is someone getting saved in these last days. It just feels like it. I, I, don't, I don't want to create a, I don't want to, what do you call it? I don't, I'm kind of tripping over my words. I don't want to create a false convert. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to compromise the Word of God so I can supposedly win more souls to Christ. If you're not compromising the Word of God and you're preaching the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Repentance is not going from unbelief to belief. But repentance is not a change of mind. God, When God repents, it's a change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. Okay, we have to have sorrow in our heart for our personal sins that we've sinned against God. That's true biblical repentance as it applies to men, mankind. Okay? I don't want to create false converts. I want to preach the truth as it is. And I quote scriptures to her: "For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Okay? There's none righteous, no, not one." Like I said. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. The wages of sin is death. And that death is hell, and then the lake of fire. That's the cost of sin. Which brings me to this next one. Okay. Today, that was a few days ago. So today, you know, I'm sitting there. I wasn't planning on witnessing to anybody. I pulled up once again. Uh, I grabbed some of my notes. I had to give Victoria a haircut and uh, take her in to get a haircut, and she's just got all this energy now, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, uh, she's made a, uh, that God has healed her, and she's, she's doing a lot better now, and I thank the brethren again for praying for her um, in the past, and continuing to pray for her, but I took some of my notes, I pulled, I dropped her off, and I went and pulled off. There's a spot you can park, like I said, by the ocean. And I go and sit by the ocean. I'm sitting there with my window down so I can hear the ocean. And I'm going through the scriptures and talking to the Lord. People might think I'm crazy. Who is this crazy guy talking in his truck to himself? I'm praying, talking to the Lord. I'm going through some Bible studies. And I'm watching the ocean. Sometimes you can see seals' heads pop up out of the water. Because there's a little area right there that the seals like to come through and fish. Um, there's boats. 
Um, in a very rare, rare occasion, you might see a whale out there, way out there. Uh, the whales will come through. Um, but I'm sitting there, and some lady comes up and says, I love your magnet. I love your magnet. Because I had a sticker on there that says, if you were to die today, do you know where, you're go where you would go? If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? Heaven or hell? And they're like, oh. her husband got out and came up and talked to me while she went for a walk. And her husband gave me this book. Now, he's a Gideon. Okay, that's the first time I come across someone that says they're Gideons. Okay, but he's Gideons. And I have a Gideon Bible that's King James Bible. And someone corrected me in, in a past video when I tried to present one of these. He said, watch out for him. And I presented one. I was like, and I wasn't using it to actually read along to do a Bible study because it's pretty small. It's like, worst case scenario, I could have this. I need bigger print for my eyes. But... I started looking into the other one I had, and it was a New King James. And I was like, I didn't want that, you know. But this one's actually a King James Bible. The Gideon started out with a King James Bible. And somehow, they, something happened. I have not researched the Gideons or nothing, but something happened where they gave up the King James Bible for a New King James. And now it's the New King James that they, they're handing out. Now, here's the thing. Somewhere along the line, remember the three enemies, the world, the flesh, Satan. Something, one of those three enemies, talked him out of God's word for the, for the new King James. Or, or they could have been like the Mormons, where they were hiding behind the King James until they could, could get something else. Okay, because the Mormons don't believe in the King James, but they carry it and they use it, but they don't believe in it. Okay. All their other books, the Mormon books, go against the King James Bible, okay? And they're told to believe all the other books, like the uh, Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and uh, there's a couple other others. And you're to believe all those books over the King James Bible. When they're in contradiction, this King James Bible is not to be believed. It's their other books, the added writings. They're hiding behind it, okay? But they don't believe in it. So could the Gideons have been the same? Like I said, if someone knows, they can put it in the comments section. Okay? So I had one situation where most of the time I hand out gospel tracts, they'll just take them and go. Most of the time when I start, the conversation goes towards the gospel, the conversation tends to end and they leave. Okay, That's, that's my normal uh, experience with preaching the gospel and handing out gospel tracts face to face. The moment the conversation turns to Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, they want to run. They don't want to talk anymore. They want to run. That's my normal experience. But in the last week, I've had two experiences. One was horrible. <laughs> like I said, I walk, when I was walking back to the truck, I was trying to remain calm. As I was walking back to the truck, I was shaking a little bit. And the reason I was shaking a little bit, Brother Christ, is because I have a... Uh, before I joined the military, I have a uh, confrontation problem. Like, I, the adrenaline would get up, my body would start shaking, you know, uh, almost like a panic attack uh, when it comes to confrontation. Well, the, the go, joining the military kind of got that out of me a little bit, having a guy in your face yelling at you. Kind of got me over a little bit. But I was, there was times I was fearing, fearing my, for my life in the military. Not because my life was, I'm talking about that panic of fear, that just that deep fear. Um... But confrontation has not always been easy with me. I want to preach the gospel, and I understand, Brother Christ, we're going to have to deal with confrontation a lot, especially in these last days. we got to trust the Lord to give us strength, and the Lord gave me strength. But shake a little. You're going to have those situ times, those experiences when preaching the gospel, where you get the shakes, because that was a scary, you know, confrontation. Sometimes you're going to get the confrontation like I got here. When I tried to show him the errors in the, in the New King James, and I tried to explain to him how you can't find the true gospel here, he, his whole attitude was this. When I would preach the truth, he would agree with the truth, but then in the next sentence, he would say something that went against the truth I just preached to him. I said, that this King James Bible is God's... I had my big, huge Bible with me at the time. I said, the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. This isn't. You can only find God's, the true plan of salvation in the King James Bible, where all the other Bibles take, they take repentance out as it applies to salvation. 
as it applies to having godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins, okay, it takes it out. It downplays it. It makes it, they try to make it out to be going from unbelief to belief. So there's no point in mentioning repentance. If you're going from unbelief to belief, we just wouldn't tell you believe and believe. That, that's kind of stupid. So we're just going to say believe and take repentance out completely. So this takes repentance out completely. And I tried talking to him, and every time I say something, I preach truth to him, truth to him. He would agree with me, but then he would make a statement that went completely against what I just said. You're going to deal with those people because they're trying to. They're, he was trying to convert me, <laughs> and they're taught to just agree with it, whatever they say, and stick to your point. I true. Uh, tr Brothers of Christ, for us, we have to say, this is truth, that's error. I can't agree with you, sir. You're wrong. But these, some of these people are taught, don't tell anybody they're wrong. Just agree with them. And it's like everything I was saying was going in one ear and right out the other. I said, in here it says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that's truth. But it's saying all you have to do is say you're a sinner. And I tried explaining to him and reaching him for the Lord and said, listen, if you just say that statement in the Bible, you can't use that verse by itself when it comes to repentance. Because if you just say, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God, you're just stating a fact. Everyone's a sinner. That's a fact. I come across lost people who admit they're sinners. That's a fact. Admitting you're a sinner and then rejecting Jesus Christ. Admitting you're a sinner is not repentance. You have to have sorrow for said sin. Not sin in a general sense, because that's all this pushes, is sin in a general sense. No, you need to have sorrow for your personal sins that you sinned against your, all, your Creator, Almighty God. I said, you, it's personal. Repentance is personal. It's not general. It's personal. And I kept trying to talk to him. Oh, you can get well. Yeah, you're right. But then he said you can get saved off of any Bible. I was like, didn't we just get? get did I just? It's like what I said just went to one ear right out the other. Well, it's basically there. I said, but these verses are wrong. This Bible, the King, the New King James, makes Jesus out to be a liar. Brother says Christ, it makes Jesus out to be a liar. I told him uh, when Jesus uh, is talking to his brothers. See. Mary is not a perpetual virgin. When Jesus is talking to his brothers, you know, the sons of Mary and Joseph, Jesus is the son of Mary, but he's not the son of Joseph. He's the only begotten son of God. So his brothers ask him, are you going to go up to the feast? I think it was the Passover, but don't, because it's been a while, but it could be the Feast of Tabernacles. But you're going up to the feast. And he says, I go not up yet. Remember, Jesus started his earthly ministry at 30. So for two years, he had 30, 31. Well, if he started at 30, maybe it happened when he was at 30. We'll go that way. 30, there was a Passover. 31, there's a Passover. 32, there's a Passover. And then the 33 Passover, when he's 33 years old, he's the Passover lamb. All right. But the point is, is his brethren, his brothers ask him, "Are you going up to the feast?" And he's, and this he says, "I go not up to the feast." The New King James. And then what happens in the next verse, or the next few verses, he goes up to the feast. They just made Jesus out to be a liar. They tore Jesus down, and if Jesus is a liar, he's not God the Father. Kind of like the pagan Trinitarians. They don't want Jesus to be God the Father. And the New King James, not on this one, but in the New King James, it's what does that uh, 666 symbol. The Trinity symbol. 666. Paganism. And their Bibles tear Jesus down. He's not God the Father. Because the God the Father, the, remember 1 Corinthians 8.6? 1, 1 Corinthians yeah, 8.6. There's to us but one capital G God, the Father. There's only one Father, or one God, the Father. And if we can prove Jesus is a liar, he's not God. And it tears, they tear Jesus down. And I tried to talk to him. I tried to talk. I didn't get anywhere with him. There's sometimes there's people you talk to, brothers and sisters Christ, when you're trying to witness for truth, you're not going to get anywhere with them. Let them alone.
They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind uh, lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Today, it's hard witnessing for Jesus Christ today. Like I said, everyone I come to has a knowledge of a Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of this Bible is not the Son of God. The Jesus Christ of this Bible here is an antichrist, and it promotes an antichrist spirit. Kind of like that woman I told you about that just went crazy. It's some kind of an evil spirit, antichrist spirit. Going nuts because I'm preaching the Word of God. Just nuts. All right? But there's times you're going to witness, and, there, and you might have a, a scary experience. There's times you're going to witness, and it's going to feel like you wasted your time. And I did. I don't know if I did. Maybe I planted some seeds. Maybe he listened, but because he'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I, I believe you. I, I believe what you believe. Yeah, I believe what you believe. And then he'd turn around and say something that went completely against what I just said. Yeah, but there's salvation right here. And I said, yeah, but it says, you know, all are sinners. God doesn't want you to admit that all are sinners. That's not what God wants. You know what God wants? God wants you to come to Him as a broken sinner. He wants you coming to Him, admitted, not just admitting you're a sinner, but having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with that. And then I asked, well, in that case, then why did they leave out that verse about repentance? This doesn't mention repentance at all. It doesn't mention hell. Oh boy, any gospel track that doesn't mention hell, right here, brothers and Christ, right here. Even if they throw it away, the very top part, there's all these hands coming up. I know it's kind of, I can't see the screen up there, it's really small, so I don't know if this comes up that visual or not. But there's a lot of hands coming up, like if everything's burning and people are burning and you see bo uh, shadows of bodies and and hands coming up, and I have on there, time is running out, for the wages of sin is death, hell. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And when you flip over to the other side, you have heaven. Remember on the front side we said, for the wages of sin is death. But then we have heaven, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And then the whole back is just words going into the whole gospel. Starting with sin. What is sin? The need for repentance. And now that you, you come to God broken as a sinner, how do you get your sins washed away? We talk about that in here. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We talk about a little bit about the changed life. Well, first confessing both in prayer, then asking God to save you. And we throw in some verses about the changed life. And we tell them on the back here, get a King James Bible today and follow along on YouTube. But the point is, is there's hell mentioned in this, in, in my gospel track. Oh, that's a big no-no. We can't mention repentance and we can't mention hell. Those are the two biggest no-nos in this easy believism world. This false Christianity world. You can't do that. And I tried talking to him, and I got nowhere. And I was nice about it. I'm kind of a little, you know, passionate right now, but I was nice about it at the time. Okay? And I tried talking to him. I tried witnessing to him. He didn't want to hear the truth. You're going to have experiences where it's scary, brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to have experiences where you're, it's like you're talking to a wall. I mean, I honestly think he's part of an occult. Have you ever talked to, I know some brethren have testimonies out there where they talk to people that are part of an occult. Nothing you say is going to sway them. Okay. Sometimes God will send the right person. Okay. I want, I, I want to make sure I make that point. There are times where God will send the right person. And, and that person is not you. But what did uh, Paul say? I have watered, uh, someone, I, I have planted, uh, uh, Paul is, uh, someone had watered, I'm sorry, I just don't, for some reason, I'm not remembering that scripture. But I've planted a polis of water, but God gives the increase. I hope I had the right name, but God gives the increase. So someone comes along and plants a seed. I've planted. Someone comes along and waters, and God gives the increase. But there are also times where God will bring the right person. Remember what Jesus said? That uh, a prophet is without honor, save in his own country. You might try to witness to people, like, the reason you have the hardest times witnessing to family members and friends 
and co-workers that knew you before you got saved is because they knew you before you got saved. And it's hard for them to take you, for some reason it's hard for them to take you seriously. That's why I always pray to the Lord sometimes for some of my family members and my brothers. I said, send somebody their way that they might, that they will listen to. Okay. You still witness to your family. Please, brothers and sisters, please witness to your family. But the reason we have the hardest time is because they know us. Sometimes we have the hardest time because we're just, God will send somebody along that, I don't know, they have something in common that piques their interest to get them to listen to you. And him and I didn't really have much in common. I don't know. But there's times you're going to be witnessing to people and it feels like you're just wasting your time. And it's not. You're planting seeds. Now, if I was out there with a group of people, remember what the Bible says, before two or three witnesses, if I was out there with a group of people and I was um, witnessing, I wouldn't have spent as much time with them. I, I would have been like, listen, you're not listening, you're not listening. Okay, at this point, you don't want to listen. I'm sorry, i got to try to reach someone who will listen. Because they're there to try to distract you. I mean, he, he kept me from getting through all my uh, notes and finish up what I was trying to do. But it's worth it to plant seeds, and it's worth it to preach the gospel. But, brothers and Christ, in these last days, the greatest miracle ever is seeing someone get saved in these last days. Truly saved and born again. And most of the brethren that I've talked to that are truly saved and born again, brothers and sisters in Christ, it seems the fewer and fewer of them are... And I, I don't talk to a lot, maybe it's because I don't have a lot of, of fellowship with tons of brethren. But it just seems like a lot of them come out of false religions. They were deceived. And at one point, they came broken to God and they wanted the truth. The Bible says, uh, seek Him. Um, gosh, wow. Seek Him while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Do I have that backwards? But the point is, is they came to a point where they were broken and they were seeking God. They were seeking Him. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. And if you're seeking truth, God will show it to you. And God has showed it to them. And God with the King James Bible to the true plan of salvation and saved them. It's very rare to come across somebody that was uh, atheist. Someone who doesn't actually know who Jesus is. Almost, like I said, I have not come across one person that has no clue who a Jesus is. But they are really clueless on who the, the definitive, only, the only begotten Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ, they're clueless. And that's what we're fighting mostly today with witnessing. Trying to break those barriers of the, the lies they've been taught, the deception, the antichrist spirit that's in them. That's what we're trying to break through and reach them. But bottom line, if they're not broken and they're not truly seeking, like they want to know God, the real God, the real Jesus Christ, all we can do is plant seeds, brother says Christ. Remember what Paul said. Okay? Know that your work is not in vain. Your work is not in vain. Okay? We need to be praying, brothers and Christ, for one another. Pray before... I, I, sometimes I forget to do that. I get so uh, in a hurry. I get so excited about going to town and leaving some gospel tracts or whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing in town. Get to see the ocean and everything up close. There's times I do forget to pray before I leave. But I need to work harder on praying, like fervent prayer. I talk to the Lord as I'm walking out to the truck, but I'm talking about what I was talking about before. We need to get back to doing some fervent prayer. I need to actually stop everything before I go to town, and I need to sit there, and I need to, even if I have to get on and uh, kneel down and bow my head in fervent prayer about helping me witness open doors. I've done that before. I'm not saying I don't do it, but there are times, brothers and Christ, we get in a hurry and we forget. We need to do some fervent prayer right? when you're witnessing for Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters Christ, please, please, please pray for us that are witnessing. Right? Uh, pray, because again, pray for the body of Christ that we stay in prayer, that we stay in the Word of God, that we're hiding God's Word in our heart, and that we're living it and keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ, that blessed hope, with the life that we're living. 
please, please, please pray for men in ministry. Please, please pray for us, brothers, as we desperately need your prayer because some men in ministry are getting distracted by the three enemies, the flesh, the world, and Satan, and they're, they're becoming part of the falling away. Please, please pray. Prayer, the power of prayer is there, brother, says Christ. Prayer is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and God. He wants to hear from you. Pray, 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 talk about anything and everything. But these are my requests, prayer requests, and this is my testimony, and thanking you again for praying for Victoria. Right. So, this is going to the fire. That's what I think of that King, new, the new King James. But I love my King James Bibles. I collect them and everything, and I give them out when, I, when people want them. And so I was able to give them a good booklet. The same people that, had that, that gave me that, the Gideons, I was able to give them a booklet on, you know, salvation, okay? Brothers and Christ, keep up the good work. Keep fighting the good fight. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes you can get discouraged, you know, get fearful, get discouraged. I'm not talking about afraid of the world, but going through scary situations. Be careful. Trust the Lord. Make sure you're doing things right. One of the biggest things, I don't know if I mentioned it, it's been a long video doing multiple parts, but... Never be afraid to walk away. Don't think you're going to be a failure if you walk away. If someone doesn't want the gospel, walk away. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Let them alone. You're not a failure. Did you try? Did it start? Sometimes it goes south quick. You try to start preaching the gospel, and it goes south, and everything seems to fall apart, and it gets starting to get scary walk away we don't we're not here to force conversion we're not here to create false converts okay i've had a sword i was thinking sword in my hand we're not here to force conversion repent or die that's not us they don't want the truth walk away pray the lord will send you somebody else that does want the truth right. we're in the last days and it's tough brothers says christ stay in prayer I love you, brothers and Christ. Pray for me. I'm praying for you guys. Okay. Stay in the Word. Okay. Remember I got uh, prayer, was it prayer and testimonies 2018 at Outlook.com. You can always email me. Real quick before I end this. Brothers and Christ, if you need anything, prayer requests. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about the Word of God. If you need help. Okay, I've been helping some brethren out. If it's within my power... Uh, spiritually, physically, financially, I'm here to try to help the brethren out. Okay, I'm here. I'm not rich. I want to throw that out there. I don't have a lot of money. Uh, I'm living off my retirement, military retirement. I don't have a lot of money, but I'm doing my best to help when I can help. But brothers says Christ, how do I say this? Because I don't want to offend anybody. Don't let pride become an issue. You need help. Ask for help. I'm here. When I need help, you guys helped me buy this camera when I was actually, uh, like I said, I'm living off of retirement and I was broke. I was in debt a little bit, got my debt paid off. I was completely broke and the camera that I had at the time was an old, old camera and it kept uh, shaking when I was trying to do videos like this and a bunch of brethren, uh, I had a couple brethren hit me up and say, why don't you ask for donations? You're doing stuff to help the brethren out. Why don't you ask for donations? I said, but I got an income. God's given me a roof and given me clothes. And, and they said, are you sure it's not pride? And it kind of humbled me. It's like, uh, okay. So I opened up uh, a PayPal account. Not a PayPal, uh, a donation type PayPal account. And some brethren helped me pay for this camera. Thank you, brothers and sisters of Christ. Brothers, don't let pride become an issue. If you need help, ask the brethren for help. We're supposed to be asking one another for help and being here for one another. Okay, not just in prayer, but physically being here. Encouraging each other through the scriptures. I keep telling the brethren that's the number one way I want to be encouraged is this right here. I don't like, be, I don't like this encouragement that much. I'm not against you. If you want to say thank you or thank you for this study, praise the Lord. But this isn't the kind of encouragement that I like. The kind of encouragement I like is when brethren say, give me verses okay, from the Bible. If I say I'm having this problem, you give me a verse that has to do with that problem. 
If I'm doing a teaching, you give me a verse to help encourage me with, uh, with continuing in the ministry, serving God, preaching His Word, hiding His Word in my heart. You know, this right here is the best encouragement we can give each other, God's Word. Okay. By all means, it's called exhortation. Okay, Ex testimonies. I, uh, instead of this, I prefer testimonies from brethren that encourage me to, to you know, continue in the ministry that I've gotten from some of the brethren that encourage me when I'm going through hard times. This is the best encouragement we can give one another. So, anyway, got the e email for the ministry, and you can go to the About page on, the, on this channel, go to the About page, and it has a P.O. box to write letters. If you're like old-fashioned, want to write letters, I, I like writing letters sometimes. I type it out more now than write because my hand shakes too much to actually write. used to be able to do cursive really good. And it's got the email address okay, for the ministry. Okay. Email me. I'm here. Okay. So I love my brothers and sisters of Christ. I do. I don't want division, although we seem to have problems with that lately. I don't want drama, although we seem to have that a lot lately. Because you have brethren turning their backs on the Word of God and going the way of the world. Um, trying to uh, justify sin for a season. Okay? Uh, I don't want to go into that too much, but Brother Says Christ, please, please, please keep praying for us. Men in ministry, for the body of Christ as a whole. Remember, remember what the Bible says, and I'm kind of rambling a little too much, but the Bible says that we're supposed to be the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. That's what we're praying for. We all need to be on the same page. And when someone starts straying from this, we need to encourage each other to get back to this. Get back to the Word of God. Get back to your relationship being strong. And it's only going to be strong as if this is your foundation. You have a strong prayer life and you have a strong Bible reading slash Bible studying life. Hiding, it in your word and hiding God's Word in your heart and living it. Okay, That's how you're going to have a strong walk with the Lord. So grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.